So if you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, this is our last Sunday in chapter 5. Uh, we are nine weeks into a 20-week long study through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we'll be turning the chapter to chapter 6 next week. It's the three-chapter sermon, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, but today, uh, we're going to be looking at the, the last of six statements that Jesus makes in a row that all follow a similar pattern. And again, I want to remind you that the title of our series is Like Jesus. Uh, and we have a blank in front of that because each week we're filling in that blank as we learn what it means to become like Jesus. We don't want to just know what Jesus said. We, we don't want to be smarter than other people and be able to tell them this is what Jesus said or this is how Jesus lived. We actually want to be transformed by Jesus to become more like him. And so uh, there's no better way to do that than to study his words that are found in the most famous sermon that not only he ever preached, but Anybody in the history of the world has ever preached the Sermon on the Mount. And so today we're going to be looking at what it means to love like Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, uh, we're going to pick it up at verse 43. If you are able, I want to invite you to stand for the reading of the word. These are the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is Perfect. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you grateful for your word and grateful that, that you sent your son Jesus to show us what God looks like, that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God, that Jesus is God in flesh. Jesus, we thank you that you came and you lived a perfect, sinless life. You showed us what that looks like and you taught us what that looks like. And we thank you that we have your words to study here today. We also thank you, Jesus, that you did not leave us or abandon us. That when you conquered death, hell, and the grave, and you ascended to the Father, you said that it was actually better for you to go so that you could send the Holy Spirit to us. So Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are with us, that you dwell in us. And I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would do what I cannot do. That you would illuminate this text to each and every one of us and that you would speak uniquely and specifically to us. And teach us what you want us to know as we study your word. I pray that you would convict where there needs to be conviction. That you would correct where there needs to be correction. That you would comfort where there needs to be comforting. And that you would compel us all to Jesus so that we can become more like him. So we say have your way and we pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. 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 You may be seated. So this is the sixth and final statement again that Jesus makes in the Sermon on the Mount, following the same pattern. So it's this pattern where he says, you have heard it said, but I tell you. And, and each of these statements, they, they come after Jesus had said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So Jesus isn't trying to contradict the law. He's not trying to downplay the law. He's trying to help us understand the true intent and the heart of the law with these six statements. And this one, I think, may be the most difficult of them all. And so, so he begins in verse 43 by saying, you have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So this is what you've heard. He's telling his crowd. Remember, this is a, a primarily Jewish crowd, but you've got some Gentiles probably mixed in there as well, maybe some Roman soldiers. You, you have a lot of Jewish people that everybody would have considered um, lower class, and then you also have some, some uh, Pharisees and some religious leaders who were there just kind of spying on Jesus, trying to figure out what is this guy really all about. And so he says, you have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. This is a phrase that they were familiar with. This was a phrase that they heard often and so much so that they, they just believed that this was in the word of God. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But the truth is, this is actually not found in the word of God. Part of it is, part of the statement is found in scripture in the Old Testament law. And part of it was just a, a, a cultural value that they attached to it. And specifically, religious leaders took this text and they tried to manipulate it in a way that they could live it out according to the way they wanted. 
rather than the way God wanted. And, and the, before we unpack that, let me just remind you that, that we are guilty of doing the same thing, where we take scriptures out of context or, or we add two scriptures, and then we, over time, start to think that that's actually what the Bible says. So, for example, I'm curious, how many of you have heard somebody tell you at some point in your life, the Bible says God helps those who helps themselves? How many of you have ever heard somebody say that before? The Bible says God helps those who help themselves. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say that. It's not in the Bible. But you've heard that so much that some of you probably think that's true. Yeah, well, God helps those who help themselves. It's not in the Bible. And actually, it's the antithesis of the Bible. And we're gonna get there in just a minute, but I just want you to know, like, that, that's heresy. That's not in the Bible. This isn't about you helping yourself, you doing your part, you, you getting yourself figured out, and then God will come along and help you. It's not in the Bible. Or how many of you have also heard somebody say, cleanliness is next to godliness. That's in the Bible. The cleanliness is next to godliness. Not in there. It ain't in there. Now, cleanliness is a good idea. It, 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 is, it is sanitary. It's a good idea. You should, it, it's important. I'm having a hard time. I've got a, I've got a seven-year-old son that I'm trying to teach this to. Taking showers is an important part of life. But it's not godly. It does not requirement to get into the kingdom of heaven. If you think about it, the first century world that Jesus lived in, they didn't shower near as much as we do. Jesus himself, probably a lot filthier than you and I are, yet he was the most godly human to ever live. So yes, cleanliness, good idea. I was just traveling this last week. I was in an airport, and I'm always so baffled at how many men will go into an airport bathroom, use that bathroom, and not wash their hands after they come out. That's gross. It's disgusting. Wash your hands, not because the Bible says so, but because your doctor says so, it's good for you. Wash your hands. You don't want a bunch of germs and diseases. Not in the Bible. Not in the Bible. So here, here, back to this text. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, where did they get that from? Well, let me show you. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, this is what it says. This is where this command comes from. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord your God. So the command is to love your neighbor. And then what happened is over time, a bunch of religious people started trying to find a way to interpret this text to say, well, yeah, okay, I'm supposed to love my neighbor, the people that I like. But what about the people I don't like? Since this text doesn't say a whole lot about that, I can just assume that it implies I'm allowed to hate my neighbor because I, I'm not supposed to bear a grudge or seek revenge against any one of my own people, but therefore I must be allowed to do that with anybody that I don't like. And so over time, they started to add to the law, love your neighbor is what the law says, and they added, but hate your enemy. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And so much so that they, they just got indoctrinated into that. In that first century Jewish world, that's what people thought the, the law said. And again, remember, most of these people are illiterate, so they can't read the scrolls for themselves. They just have to trust what the religious leaders teach them. And so I would just tell you the same thing. Whenever somebody comes up to you and they say, well, the Bible says, the next question you should ask is, Where? Where? Where does it say that? Don't take somebody else's word for it. You should be reading your own Bible. You should be reading the Bible for yourself and seeing what the Bible actually has to say. Because I want to show you from the Old Testament law, we're not even going to the New Testament yet, from the Old Testament law why that is fundamentally flawed. In Exodus chapter 23, still Old Testament law, Genesis, Exodus, chapter 23, verses 4 and 5, this is what it says. If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off... Be sure to return it. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure to help them with it. So the principle of loving your enemy was clear in the Old Testament law. Now, there might be some people who are sitting here today thinking, well, yeah, praise God, none of my enemies own any donkeys or any oxen, so I'm off the hook here. Modern day translation would be, if you see your enemy with a flat tire alongside the road, stop and help them. Don't just pass them by. Even someone who hates you, you are to go out of your way when you see your enemy struggling to help them. That is, brothers and sisters, that's Old Testament law, which tells us the bare minimum that's expected of us. 
And Jesus says, I'm here to reveal the full intent of the law. The, yes, the law shows you the bare minimum, but I'm, I'm calling you to a higher standard than this. I'm not here to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And so look at the text again, Matthew 5, verse 44 and 45. He says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The one who causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. We just sang from the rising sun to the setting same, I will praise your name. I will praise your name. And so the way we do that is by, by being obedient to the commands of Jesus. I tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. So here's something that I've learned in my life. Children often look like their parents. How many of you have ever been told, you look just like your mama or you look just like your daddy? Just curious. How many have been told? Been, some of you are like, yeah, it happened and I don't really like that fact. I wish I didn't look so much like my mom or my dad. Children look just like their parents. They reflect the image of their parents. And, and you can look and compare your baby pictures with now your kids' baby pictures and you can see so many similarities. They they're made in your image. They reflect your image. And, and not only do they reflect your image, but they, they reflect your mannerisms. So I don't live close to my family. My parents live in North Carolina, and so I don't get to see them that often. And as I've gotten older, I, I like to think, yeah, I'm a whole lot different than, than my parents until I get around my dad. And then I start noticing, man, the same mannerisms, the same like little annoying tics or whatever it may be. That I've got them, and I thought they were just mine. I'm like, oh, they came from you. That's your fault. That's where that came from. And, and for some of you, not only your mannerisms, not only the way you look, but, but for many of us, our behaviors come from our parents because it's what's modeled to us over our lifetime and it's imprinted into us at a very young age. And so there are some people who are sitting in this room right now and you still find yourself fighting against some, some battles that are actually generational battles. We call those generational curses that have been handed down from one generation to the next to the next. So there are some people who are sitting in here today, and man, you've been fighting against this addiction to alcohol, and so did your dad, and so did your granddad. See, that, that's you reflecting the image of your parents. And so now let's, let's go back to the text here. What does Jesus say? I tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. So can I remind you, if you are in Christ, if you have received salvation from Jesus, you have been adopted into a new family. So even if, even if the family you came from was a difficult one, or maybe you don't have a relationship with your mom or your dad, or maybe it was a difficult relationship and you don't want to associate with them anymore, I'm here to tell you, in Christ, you've been brought into a new family, and you have a perfect heavenly Father who will never leave you, will never abandon you, will always love you, will always show up for you, no matter what. And not only that, but your identity has been changed. So not only have you been adopted into a new family, but the same you isn't the same you anymore. The old you is dead and gone, and you have been raised to new life in Christ Jesus. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's your identity. And so listen to me. It's Jesus is saying, it's time for you to live into your identity. See, you've been lied to. You've got to live into your identity. You're, you're no longer a child of this world anymore. You're a child of God. You've been set apart you are holy. You are chosen. Listen, every Thursday morning, I have been teaching these young men what it means to be a godly man. Every week, we have an affirmation on the wall, and it's not, I want to be. It's not, I am becoming. It's, I am, because this is what God says about me already. Whether I feel like it or not, this is who I am. This is who you are. And so now it's time to live into that. This is what God has called you to do. This is what Jesus says, that you may be a child of your Father in heaven. Know who you are, know whose you are, know who you belong to, and then act like it. I tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And so then how does your heavenly father act? If you're going to act like your heavenly father, how does your heavenly father act? Let me ask you this. How did he act toward you? How did your heavenly father act toward you? 
Well, let me show you. Again, I want to show you from the scripture, not, not my ideas. I want to show you the word of God. Romans chapter 5. Picking it up at verse 6, we're going to read through 6 through 10. Romans 5, the Apostle Paul says this, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless. So God doesn't help those who help themselves. You were powerless. Powerless means you have no power. It means you can't help yourself. You can't fix yourself. You can't change yourself. Stop trying to change yourself into the kingdom of God and start surrendering your life into the kingdom of God. While you were still powerless, the text says. Not powerful, powerless. Christ died for who? The ungodly. Not the godly. Not those who are better than others. Nobody is better than anybody else. There's one hero of the Bible. There's one hero in this world. His name is King Jesus. And everybody else is an ungodly individual who happens to be saved by his grace or not. That's it. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But listen to this. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. This is what your heavenly father said. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not once you got it figured out. Jesus died for your sins, past, present, and future. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Listen to this, verse 10. For if while we were God's enemies, if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him, through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life, his resurrection life? So how did God treat you? Well, you were his enemy. Every single one of you, I want to remind you that you were his enemy at one point in your life. You were his enemy. You, you weren't born saved. Some of y'all were born into a Christian family. You had saved parents. And at some point along the way, you had saved brothers, saved sisters, and you were a sinner. And so were your parents, and so were your brothers, and so were your sisters, until while you were powerless, God said, you, I want you, and I'm going to rescue you, and I'm going to save you. You're an enemy of mine, and this is how I'm going to treat you. I'm going to send my son to die on the cross for you, because I love you that much, because I'm for you that much. Even though you are my enemy, I will reconcile you to myself. So how did God treat his enemies? He sent his only son to die for them. Go back to the text. Picking it back up, verse 46. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So let me translate this for you into our modern day world because it's real easy to sit here and read this and, and judge them. I mean, I can't believe that they would live in a world where they thought they could love their neighbors and hate their enemies. That's shameful. Well, let me, let me try this one on for you. If, if you love those who vote like you, what reward will you get? Don't even the Democrats do that? Don't even the MAGA Republicans do that? If you only love those who were born in this country and hate those who were not, what makes you any different than the world around you? If you, if you love those who share the same skin color as you and hate those who do not, what makes you any different than the world around you? If you love those who only had the same cultural upbringing as you and hate those who do not? What makes you any different than the world around you? If you love those who, who only like the same worship style as you and hate those who do not? Now listen, every now and then I'll have somebody who will tell me, Pastor, I, I really enjoyed your sermon, but I didn't, really, I didn't really care for the worship today. And I'll say, good. We weren't worshiping you. I don't, I, don't, 
I was I, I didn't I didn't ever never cross my mind. Never once. And and also just just because I already went there, I'm gonna get gonna get the email anyway. I'll just tell you like there's a difference between what you're culturally comfortable with and then what true worship looks like. And it's going to look different, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. And so there are people gathering all over the city of Fort Wayne right now, worshiping Jesus in very different styles. And, and, and it's not about the style of worship, it's about the heart of worship. And so listen, you, you can jump and down and, and bounce all around a stage and, and worship God in spirit and in truth, or you can do it for the wrong reasons. And you can sit there like the frozen cho- chosen and worship God all, all, all day long with the wrong heart or the right heart as well. And so, do you love the people who think like you, act like you, worship like you, believe like you? Let me take this a little bit further. If you only love those who share the same values that you do, what difference is there between you and the rest of the world? If you only love those who who believe the same things you do and worship the same one true God that you do. If you only love them and you hate the rest of the world, then what what separates you from the rest of the world? The unique thing about Christianity that sets us apart is that we have no right to not love anyone. We are called to love every single person, regardless of their background, regardless of their beliefs, regardless of their culture, regardless of how they were raised, regardless of what they look like, think like, or vote like, you and I are called to love each and every person because whether, whether they're our neighbor or whether we would consider them our enemy or they would consider us their enemy, Jesus says, okay, yeah, you want to treat them as, as an enemy? Good. Here's what you do. You love them. You love them. You feel like they're your enemy? Good. Here's what you do. You love them. And you pray for them. And now there are some people who are probably sitting here going, well, I've read some prayers in the Old Testament. They pray for their enemies. And they pray for their destruction. And I, I, I'm, I'm a realist, man. Like, here's where I, where I always start. When people come to me and they're like, well, what about that? I'm like, yeah, start there. You can start there. But let God change your heart. It's better for you to pray an honest prayer than not a, real, or not a prayer at all. So start there. But allow God to change your heart. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about some sort of fake, phony, pretend kind of of love here that that acts as if there aren't real differences in our world or real issues in our world or or real challenges in our world or that you haven't actually really been hurt by somebody else in this world. That's not what I'm trying to tell you to do because that's not loving. That's lying. And lying isn't loving. So I'm not telling you to lie. But I'm also telling you there's a difference between a feeling and an action. And when we see the word love in Scripture, it's speaking to action here. It's not about your feeling. It's not about how you feel towards someone. It's about an action. Actually, let me show you uh, another text here. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. This is what uh, the Apostle Paul writes to a church, a local church in Ephesus. So this isn't written to the world. This is written to a, a group of believers. And he says this, in your anger, do not sin. Assuming... That within a local church body, you're going to find situations where you're angry with one another. You're going to run into circumstances where you're actually angry with each other. That's going to happen in a church community. In your anger, do not sin. He's not saying don't be angry. It's going to happen. Especially the more we actually do life with one another. The more we actually get into each other's lives and spend time with one another and share with one another, there are going to be situations where where there will be conflict and and you will find yourself angry with one another. The more we we get out of just sitting in rows next to each other and getting into our homes with each other, this will happen. And so what do you do about it? Do you pretend? Do you act like, oh, it's no big deal? Do you brush it off? No, no, no. What the text says is in your anger, do not sin. So, or, Or some translations would say, be angry and don't sin. You can do both of those things. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're angry and do not give, give the devil a foothold. And so this, this statement, do not let the sun go down while you're angry, it's not talking about literally a, a 24-hour period and that you have to be over it entirely, but it's, it's essentially saying, hey, don't hold on to this for too long. 
Because the longer you hold on to this, the more it will hold on to you. That's why the very next verse says, do not give the devil a foothold. Because the longer you hold on to anger, the more anger will hold on to you. And the enemy will use that as a foothold in your life. So yes, we absolutely should hold one another accountable. We should speak the truth in love to one another. But we should do it in love. We should attack, listen to me, the problem and not the person. The moment you shift from attacking the problem to now attacking the person, you have crossed over into sin. We attack the problem, not the person. And I think if if our politicians could figure that out, we'd be in a whole lot better place right now. Attack problems, not people. We're in this together. We need one another. So yes, we we can have real good conversations and debates over over the competing good and and what, what the best ideas are, but we attack problems, not people. Listen to me, in your marriage, attack the problem, not the person. There are some people in this room here who you've been married long enough that you know, yes, I can love someone and be angry with them. And if you're sitting here and you're going, that that ain't me, then you haven't been married long enough. (laughs) Just wait. But when you get angry, how do you handle that anger? What do you do with it? You attack the problem, not the person. You don't go after them. You go after the issue. Listen to me, married couples, you're on a team together. You are on a team together. You're not against one another. You're on a team together. You have entered into a covenant relationship ordained by God himself. He is blessed. He loves your marriage. He's called it good. You're on a team together, and there will be issues that arise. You don't attack one another. You team up together and say, we've got to attack this problem. This is a problem that we have to attack together. But if, if, if you're not careful, listen to me. The text says, do in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're angry, and do not give the devil a foothold And it's talking to the people who weren't actually in the wrong. Did you catch that? You can be wronged. And in that moment, the enemy can use that. He can use wounds to create an opening to get a foothold in your life. And over time, that foothold will become a stronghold. And I've seen this play out over and over and over again. See, we live in a world that likes to think that the only way we can allow the enemy to attack us is by, by jumping into some dark and demonic stuff. And we don't realize that anger is one of the primary ways that he actually gets a foothold in our lives. So all of a sudden, you, you don't even understand why you're acting the way you are, and you have to trace it back to the specific time where you, you didn't handle that anger correctly. It wasn't even the wrong that you did. It's how you responded when you were wronged. So now the enemy has a foothold in your life, and that foothold becomes a stronghold. So again, this command is not telling us to never get angry, to not tell the truth, to not speak the truth, but to do it in a godly way. So what does it mean to love our enemies practically? How do we do this? Again, I want to show you from Scripture. We we talked about this text a few weeks ago. We're going to revisit it again today. The most robust definition of love that you will ever find from the Bible itself. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. The Apostle Paul writes this, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but, ha- but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. And then here we go. What does this look like? What does it look like to love your enemy? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, listen to this, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. So listen, I think we live in a world where we have an awful lot of resounding gongs and clanging cymbals. We have a whole lot of that going on in the church world too. I'm going to help you out here. Stop 
arguing with people on the internet. Get off the comment section of Facebook. Stop it. When is the last time you ever changed somebody's mind in the comment section of some Facebook post when you're arguing with a complete stranger? I don't know if y'all know this, but like a third of the time it's bots. It's not even real people you're arguing with. So stop it. You're a resounding gong. You're a clanging cymbal. This is what love looks like with your enemies, if that's a category of people for some of you, or if that's an individual for some of you. Love is patient with them. Love is kind toward them. You'll notice there's not a whole lot of talk in this definition about how you feel. Don't follow your feelings. Follow the word of God. Be obedient to the word of God. Love is patient. Love is kind. I don't feel like being kind. Good. Do it anyway. Because love isn't about how you feel. You're going to be kind because scripture tells you to. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love does not dishonor others. So the way in which you talk about or talk to or treat those who you would see as your enemy, is it honoring or dishonoring? Because I would argue that it's either one or the other. So if it's not honoring, it's probably dishonoring. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It doesn't say that you never get angry. But it means that you're not always looking for a reason to be angry with that person. Always looking and waiting for them to, to mess up so you could just be angry at them all over again. It keeps no record of wrongs. It means that you give them a clean slate. It means that you're not holding their past against them. Love does not delight in evil. This is so important. Does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. So this is what this text is saying. Love speaks truth. Love tells the truth. Love holds people accountable and it tells the truth. Love doesn't lie. It's not loving to lie to people. And sometimes, in order to keep the peace, we will lie to people. But the text doesn't say keep the peace. It says don't delight in evil, but rejoice with the truth. So yes, you can rejoice with the truth. You can do it in a joyful and loving way, but still tell the truth. And tell the truth to people in a way that honors them, doesn't dishonor them. You attack the problem, not the person. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. We live in a world that wants to say there is no such thing as truth. That's a lie from the pit of hell, and it's the least loving thing that you could ever buy into. There is such thing as truth. There's absolute truth, and there's God's word, and his word is absolute truth. So we align ourselves with God's word. When we tell the truth and we do it in a loving way, we don't lie to people just to make someone feel good. We rejoice with the truth. And then finally, love always protects, love always trusts, love always hopes, and love always perseveres. So I wanna challenge you now as you think about that list, that definition, to replace the word love with your first name. And then ask yourself, how do you measure up? Chris is patient. Chris is kind. Chris does not envy. He does not boast. Chris is not proud. Chris does not dishonor others. Chris is not self-seeking. He's not easily angered. And he keeps no record of wrongs. Chris does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Chris always protects, he always trusts, he always hopes, and he always perseveres. I don't know about you, but that, that's convicting for me. That's convicting for me, because this is what Jesus is calling us to. And not just with our neighbors, but with our enemies. With our enemies. And this is how Jesus lived his life. So now, instead of putting your name in there, put his name in there. And let's see how he measures up. Jesus is patient. Has he not been patient with you? Has Jesus not been kind to you while you were an enemy of his? Has Jesus ever envied or boasted? Has he ever sh showed pride in any way? Did he not humble himself completely? Did Jesus ever dishonor anyone? 
Was Jesus self-seeking? No, he was self-sacrificial. Jesus was not easily angered and he keeps no record of wrongs, including yours and including mine. He's not holding it against you. He said he's taken it. He's wiped it away. He's washed it away. His blood washed away your sins, your record of wrongs. It's been covered. It's been taken care of. Jesus did not delight in evil. He rejoices with the truth, and he is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus always protects. He always trusts. He always hopes, and Jesus always perseveres. Jesus wins every single time. Every time, he is victorious. And this is who we're putting our hope and our faith and our trust in. And he's saying, now, you've been adopted into a new family. You are children of God. So let's act like it. Let's live like it. We're gonna close our time today by celebrating the Lord's table, closing with communion. If you did not receive communion elements when you came in today, just simply raise your hand where you are. Our ushers will make their way around and make sure that you receive one. Just keep your hand up until they make it to you and they'll make sure you get get what you need. And as we're preparing for that, I just want to let you know how we do this here at City Church. We just ask that you be a member of the body of Christ, that you've surrendered your life to Christ, that you've received his free gift of salvation, and you can participate with us in communion here today. The elements here are contained in one package so the bread is on the bottom you'll open that first and then the cup is on the top and you'll open that second we'll partake together here in a moment but I just want to remind you that on the night that Jesus himself was to be arrested on the night that he would be tried and then later crucified Jesus was sharing one last meal the meal we're about to partake in one last meal with his disciples and showing them what love looks like. And I want to remind you that, yes, it was his disciples, his his closest friends, the inner 12 that he had poured his life out for, that he had loved so well, that he had cared for so well, that he had taught, that he had demonstrated what God looks like in the flesh for them. And as he was sitting around that table and and breaking the bread and sharing the cup, he shared it with all 12, including the one who would betray him. And he knew it. The scriptures tell us that he knew it before it happened. That he knew that Judas would betray him. And that Judas would become his enemy. And Jesus still gave him the bread. And still gave him the cup. And not only that, but during that meal... Jesus got up, took his outer garment off, wrapped a towel around his waist, and then went and knelt down and washed the feet of every single one of his disciples, including Judas, his betrayer and enemy. He washed their feet. Something that a rabbi would never, ever do under any circumstances, he did. He washed the feet of his disciples. Peter tried to stop him, said, Lord, you should never wash my feet. And Jesus said, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you cannot be a participant in my kingdom. Jesus insisted and he washed every single one of their feet. His betrayer, Peter, who would deny him three times, and all the rest of the disciples who would abandon him that night at his hour of greatest need. And and these were his closest friends. And Jesus said, I'm going to wash your feet. And then at the end of that meal, John 13 Verse 34 and 35, he said to them, a new command I give to you, love one another. Now that's not the new command. We haven't gotten there yet. But he expounds on it. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is what it looks like. As I have loved you, as I have washed your feet, as I have washed the feet of my betrayer, as I have loved you, this is how you are to love one another. And watch this, verse 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Not by how much scripture you have memorized, not by how many Sundays in a row you go to church, not by how good your theology is, 
not by who you vote for or don't vote for. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another as I have loved you. Unconditionally. Every single one of us were an enemy of God. While we were yet sinners, powerless sinners, enemies of God, the Father sent the Son, and the Son willingly gave his life on a cross, his body broken, his blood shed for you and for me. And so before we partake in communion, I want to just give you about a minute here to reflect and, and, and to bring before the Lord. If there's anyone or any group of people in your life that you're still holding on to unforgiveness, that you're still holding on to bitterness, that you're still holding on to anger toward, that you have refused to love, and to release that right here and right now at the table of the Lord Jesus so that the devil cannot have a foothold in your life. So if you would just take a minute to reflect and release that to God, and then we will partake together. us while we were yet sinners, enemies of God, and that you have adopted us into your family, that we are now sons and daughters of the Most High God. We thank you that you have invited us to act like it, to love our neighbors and our enemies. So right now, God, we pray for those who we have seen as enemies maybe those who have persecuted us or have opposed us. God, we release, release them and we release that unforgiveness, that bitterness, and that anger. We surrender it all to you. And we are grateful that you have invited us to partake in your table today. When Jesus was with his disciples, he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Let's do that together now. took the cup and said, this is my blood shed for you. Take and drink. Let's do that together now. Once again, Jesus, we thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And so we fix our eyes on you. We set our sights on you. We choose to see people the way you see them as image bearers of the most high God. Friends, neighbors, foes, and enemies, all created in your image. So God, I pray that you would help us, empower us by your Holy Spirit to love our enemies in the same way, Jesus, that you loved us. And I pray that the, the world would know that we are your disciples, that it would be evident and clear because of the way that we love one another. Have your way as we go from this place. We love you, we thank you for your word, and we pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen.